A lot of you already asked questions, but ask them again because we'd like to get them on tape. Anything you're editing for an audience, and when you were talking about all the politics, I never actually heard the word audience something. So how do you do that in terms of your editing? How do you consider it? The assumption is that whether you're getting a written script or even shot things to a song, that a lot of thinking has gone on about the audience. I mean, from everything, how they're dressed and how they're, you know, makeup and everything, who the stars are. So if I just take what's given to me and make it understood, then it's for the audience that it should be unless someone screwed up. A lot of the work I do is sort of pre-sold to usually a network. So that audience is predetermined. What show are you working on now? Uh, well, actually now I'm working on a syndicated show, but formerly I was on Top Gear. Right. Um, okay. And that has a, a, a rabid fan base. Yes, it does yeah. have a rabid fan base. So they know who their fan base yeah. is. And so you're just, it's already, it's a high concept show, yeah. right? So it's that concept, the audience likes that concept, so. It's based on a, a very popular British show that I think has run for 16, 17 years. So the styles pre-established it. I don't want to be negative, but I can't help but kind of tie this into something that I was thinking today, how stressed I am at all times. I do on-air promotion, uh, primarily, mm -hmm. for networks. You know, nine years of those deadlines is you know, taking some time off my life. I'd like to hear a stressful day for you and where the stress comes from, because I certainly can tell you where mine comes yeah. from. But <laughs> what about what, what you do to reduce it? To right, exactly. <laughs> Yoga. 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 <laughs> diet. Good diet. Good you diet. You have to take yeah. care of yourself. And exercise. Yes. Yeah. Try to take breaks. <laughs> All I yeah, I mean, editing is. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think diet's important. I edit standing up. Oh. Um, I just started that in the last year, and I think it really has helped me because it mm. keeps me. It just, I don't know, I'm using my body differently. You know, for years, I would just, you know, run into the edit room, get a coffee, make a bagel, sit there for hours, eat a big lunch in front of the app. So I don't do that anymore. I, I, I say, at lunch, we're taking a break, I'm going out, I want to get some fresh air. I walk every morning, which I didn't do for years, but since I started doing it, it's changed my life. So. Much better. Yeah. Derek, do you also do exercise? Um, I try to. I don't get to do that every day because of the deadlines. Um, and. Um, they're right, it does really help you creatively, um, just to step away, get a little air, a little, get the blood flowing again, yeah. A shy person asked me to ask a question. What editing gear do you use? And, what you editing? know, I mean, do you use Avid? Do you cut Avid, Final Cut Pro, blah, 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 what version of Final Cut Pro, et cetera? I use Avid. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends on the version they sometimes let you have. Sometimes you mm -hmm. get what they give you. <laughs> yeah, Avid or Final Cut, but I prefer Avid. Yeah, and Sabian. Yeah. Avid and Final Cut. For everybody, but mainly Derek, you do a lot of the reality stuff. It, you mentioned a little bit about how, you know, you used to have one editor on one show, and now it's four or five editors on one show. But I'm also finding that you'll have a story producer who does a string out, and then uh, an offline editor gets it, and then it goes to a finishing editor. And uh, do you feel like lose, you, you are losing ownership of the show, or do you? Do you uh, well, not every show is done that way. Yes, I do feel like I'm losing ownership. Uh, of the show when I give in a string out. It's just the time constraints again. Um, it's got to get done quickly and so mm -hmm. to have someone do a little pre-work. I usually, even if I have to stay a little later, try to get to look at the raw material um, and see how, the, if there's something that they've missed or how I can improve it. When you work on the shows that you work on, do you find, because I find when I'm working on things, uh, I mostly do color and a little bit of editing, that I get too on top of the job that I start to lose a little bit of perspective and the freshness that you might have coming to something that you haven't been to in a while. How do you each manage that in trying to stay as, as fresh as possible? It's easy when it's working to me. It's easy. It's when it's not working and you're pretty sure it's not ever going to really work well, that's when everyone has some, that's when it's, you start to lose everything. Because if it's kind of basically there and you're tweaking this and that, it's not hard. I usually have some people in the office with you and I would bring them in strategically and not so much that they would, I would listen to what they're saying, but as they're watching it, I'm watching it with them and it just, you, you just, 
thinking what they're thinking and you're seeing it fresh. But I think that's the hardest thing. I think that's the hardest thing for clients too because they fix a problem and they cause another one but they only see the problem they fixed. And mm. I think editors, that's our job is mm -hmm. to stay fresh. I think you, if you can't do that, you, you're not in the right, you have to keep fresh with the other yeah. guys. It's hard. So. It's very hard. I mean, I, I would do things, I, I tell you things I used to do. If it was an anamorphic film, I would squeeze it together. If it was uh, non-anamorphic, I would pull it out. I'd take the color out and watch it in black and white. Yeah. It, it certainly right. helps to work, to look at it on different mm -hmm. uh, size screens. Mm -hmm. The best advice I can give you, if you have the time and the opportunity, if it's a scene that just doesn't work, walk away from it, yeah. start a new scene. Yep. Come back the next day and look at it, because that'll give you a fresher perspective. And I found that works a lot. You know, literally, it's like sometimes I feel like it just has to gel overnight. Just leave it there. And, and sometimes it's a simple few things, or you realize you can't, you, you, maybe you got to play it all in reactions. Whatever the solution is, there's usually a solution. You just have to clear your mind and find it. Not so easy sometimes. So objectivity is the greatest challenge we face on a daily basis, because when you're working 14, 16, 18 hours a day, I mean, you're going to be up close and personal in those scenes. It's hard to pull back and see it fresh. So that, any you know, little trick. That 20-minute walk also helps a lot. Totally. And yeah. I think, you know, bringing someone to watch it with you, mm. suddenly you become more critical. Especially if you have two or three assistants who come in and they all say the same thing. Mm. Like, <laughs> Aha, there may be some truth. Uh, would anyone like to talk about how you use music? how much say you have in the music, how much it helps you, how much it becomes a crutch or gets overused? Well, I definitely think it can be overused. I mean, I never put music, I never cut with music. I know some editors like to cut with music. Um, I never do. I think my first understanding of the scene, I just want to, I don't know, I just want to see it without anything. And I often think that if it can work without music, it's really going to work with the music. And that might also mean that you re-edit it once the music goes in, you know? Right. But um, you really want to try to un have an understanding of the material and the scene as it works. I often compare music to, like, sauce. You know, if you're, cu if you're cooking a filet mignon, you want to make sure that that steak is great before you put anything on it, you know? And, if you're going to ladle on, you know, some other ketchup or Bernays sauce or whatever it is, it's going to change the flavor of what it is, but the underlying meat has really got to be cooked to perfection, you know. So I don't want to overuse music, and I think people have a tendency to, to it's a crutch, you know, it, they, they use music to sell the cut or the emotion or the thing that's not working in the scene. I go with the same school. The only time I'll ever cut to music is if I know a song has already been purchased or the intention is to use that song, and there's a reason why you would want to cut that scene to music, because it's like almost a music video within the movie kind of thing, maybe. If that's a... Right, or a montage. A montage, yeah. yes, an isolated case. But I never cut the music. Uh, I, I, and usually what I feel is, uh, even though I'm not cutting the music, I'm actually composing a score in my head while I'm cutting. Literally, I do that all the time. So I'll be, sometimes even humming it, but <laughs> ta -da -ta -da -ta -ta, whatever it is. And, but that's based on the footage. The footage has rhythms in it, and then the cuts are going to be rhythmic as well. Actually, editing is an incredibly musical form, as you know. So yes, I say, I will compose the music, and then the composer can follow my rhythms. And it's the same, you know, it's interesting you talk about not having the music as a Band-Aid or something that makes it work, because it will work better with the right music. And sometimes also a dialogue scene. I've actually heard of people who cut dialogue scenes without listening to the dialogue. Now, whether you do that or not, it's interesting to watch your dialogue scene without the dialogue, the audio off, because uh, sometimes you just know when the cuts are supposed to come. It's got to do with eye contact, head turns, da -da -da, boom, boom, whatever they're doing. Now, actually, the performances will mandate the cuts. And by the way, that also goes to your question about how to look at something fresh. Like once I cut something, I'll, I'll watch it silent mm -hmm. and you know see whether it works for me or what different interpretation I get just from watching it without any dialogue. And um, so that's one trick. You know, music will also heighten an emotional <coughs> point of view. Let's say you can have sappy music, you know, very romantic music, comic music. 
But you don't want any of that. You want to see how it's playing with just the dialogue and the visual rhythmic counterpoint that you've created in the edit. Do you guys have any more um, nightmare director stories? And how you guys, <laughs> <laughs> and how, and how you, how you solved them? We haven't really told any. No. We didn't have time to get into that. I want to keep working, actually. Yeah, some yeah. Of us, yeah. <laughs> we have confidence. Oh, but somebody can, somebody can tell a. Can't anybody tell a good nightmare story? Well, I'll tell you There's one story that like I won't. Kill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, definitely. Look, I mean, some some directors, and you've heard of some of them, have big egos, and also maybe personality if things go on. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Now, actually, Michael can be a lot of fun, but it just depends, you know. I mean, honestly, when I think of the biggest ego type directors that I've worked with, they're they're also incredible fun to work with, and most of them have real talent. I mean, different kinds of talents. But uh, you know, Jim Cameron is legendary, and I'm, I'm only going to say he's bigger than life. And uh, but he's brilliant, you know. So you yeah, take, yeah. you know, he, certain people have almost earned the right. I think it's the ones who haven't earned the right who do it anyway. It's the egotists who don't have any talent. That's that's the, the kind of people who drive you up the wall. So tell us a story about one of those guys. <laughs> no, no. But I'm going to tell you about one director, but I'm not going to tell you who he is. <laughs> because I just don't want to, but uh, and and uh, but anyway, it's an interesting story, and it's, I think there's a lesson that I learned. It was kind of a life lesson. Uh, I, I came on a picture uh, because uh, the original director was having personal issues and wasn't really, you know, they weren't happy. The producers and director were not happy, and uh, it was just one of those situations. So I kind of went down to a location and took over this picture. But what happened was, since the producers had uh, hired me, the director was very standoffish with me and actually wouldn't talk to me. So he would communicate through the assistant who would remain from the previous uh, team. And uh, he said, tell, tell him to use take three, something <laughs> like that. And, and he would also do, he would just play all these kind of tricks. Now, this, this particular director uh, had a reputation for firing a lot of people. Early on, just so that you knew, you know, to be on your toes. What happened was, I got a phone call from some guy. Literally, this was when my career was kind of just taking off. I got a call from this director who was doing a movie, who had discovered my resume in the trash can in his production office. Because <laughs> literally, not that long ago, I was actually hand delivering resumes to pictures that I knew were starting. So, and he really wanted me to do this movie. I knew this guy's work. I thought, well, hey, I could do his movie. He, he, he wants to work with me. This guy doesn't want to work with me because he's always you know, being standoffish. So I told the producers, uh, well, you know, I don't think I can do your picture because, I mean, I don't think uh, the director really wants to work with me anyway. But I can tell you what the problems are here. You got to do this, 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 and this. You got to shoot this stuff in second unit. Uh, I'm not the guy you need. And the producer said, you're exactly the guy we need. You cannot leave the picture. Uh, so I'm thinking, oh, shit, well, what am I going to do? <laughs> then, then, then that night, I get a call from the director. And the director says, Mark, what is this I hear about you leaving? Is it something I said? Maybe it's my <laughs> accent, because he was European. And, uh, <laughs> and it was like the most amazing turnabout. Because what I didn't realize was that well, basically what I was saying was I, I quit. You know, now, most people are worried that they're going to get fired, but I, obviously I didn't care. Now, it helped that I had another job in the bag. <laughs> I don't think I might have done that if I didn't have this other job. But it turned everything around, broke through all the bullshit. And what turned out is that I became not only very collaborative with this director, and we really worked out well and respected each other, but uh, we actually became very good friends. So the lesson there, if there is a lesson, and I can't say it works all the time, it's just sometimes you have to do what you feel you should do and not worry about the consequences. Because something happened as a result of, what I, of that move I made that was not what I had intended, but it was really great. I mean, had I not done that, it might have been an adversarial relationship throughout the whole picture. Did he so, tell you why he was talking to you through the assistant? Oh, I knew why. It's, it's very simple. People, it's easy when you have that much power to take a position of defensive power, but what, what most of us don't understand is that the people who do that are often operating out of fear because he has to answer to people above him. A star, 
producers. You know, actually being a director can be a very lonely job. You gotta be up every morning and tell hundreds of people what to do and you better get it right. And you know, you got egos of actors that you're dealing with. It's a very hard job, hardest job on a picture, no doubt. Uh, at least the ones who are actually doing the job. Because you could walk through that job and maybe get away with it. Especially if you have a good crew on a show and doing it. But the really great ones, hardest job in the world. I mean, the other lesson I get from that is you can turn a relationship around. Hmm. You know, it, like sometimes you might, for whatever reason, you get thrust into a situation or there's a misunderstanding or something. It doesn't mean that that's the way the relationship has to go. You know, I mean, it's a collab collaborative medium. You have time to work through things. Mm -hmm. You can turn these relationships around into something that, where there's mutual respect and trust and that you, you should always be working towards that. You know, if you, if you get into an adversarial if, relationship or where you stop talking to each other, the director doesn't want to talk to you, you're not going to talk, it's going to be a disaster. Yeah. The, the, the project's not going to be any good. You're not going to have fun, you know. So fit, always be optimistic and try to be proactive and like trying to make a, do what you can to mend fences to make a good relationship. Absolutely. So I guess you're not going to hear any juicy <laughs> director nightmare stories, at least not in a public forum. Buy him a drink afterwards. Right? They have to be nice to you, though. They have to be nice to editors. It's not like a set. And, I mean, I think it's too. Well, I don't think they all feel that people? way. Yeah. <laughs> it's a complicated thing, and you it's, know, and I actually, you know, I've seen directors like do crazy right there, things. You know, but yeah. uh, you know, some, you got to understand what they're up against too. I mean, I, I totally I agree with that. I totally agree. You have to know the pressures your people are under, and yeah. you have to help them. You know, you have to let them know that you're on their side, and even though you know their problems, they know your problems, but you're going to talk about what you're going to do. Yeah, I think you're a lot. Gonna, you're going to make it work. It's, you really are like the house. I always think I'm the housewife. You know? The housewife. <laughs> can I, I, mean, can I know, give you some dinner, dear? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like in a sense, I, I think, yeah, you know, I, I think directors are in a very vulnerable yes. position, well, especially when they're up, you know, show, just about to show their first cut. Mm. Because, you know, think about, I mean, especially in a, in a big feature, you know, millions upon millions of dollars have been spent right. to make this thing. And it's their vision, essentially. They were the ones that called the shots and made m most of the major decisions up until that point. And if it's, you know, and often by that point, they're way too close to their own material. They can't tell right. if it's good. So they're very vulnerable. And I think that that can cause them sometimes to act. That, that fear, right, can cause mm -hmm. them to like act in crazy ways and do things. Or, and you have to have that, you have to know that as an editor and know how to calm them down and to reassure them and to be their, you know, sort of... Uh, confidant. Confidant, yeah. yeah. Very important. Interpersonally, yeah. the job is mm -hmm. really... I mean, it, it, it really boils down to personal relationship in many ways. It seems to me when I work with people that are what I would call old school, that came from that discipline, linear tape, news, promo, whatever, give me, you know, they're, they know what they want, they know how to get it, and I was wondering how, if you guys, with that feel, that experience that you got from that, how that helps you cut to the chase, so to speak. Well, let, let me just say one thing, because I had the good fortune to work in film. I did a lot of work in film. I cut a whole bunch of movies on film before I switched over. But even, even, when I started, we were already using revolutionary editing techniques that previous generations didn't have. For example, we had mylar splicing tape. Yeah. Uh, if you don't know what happened before that, then you won't understand what a revolution this was. Because for the first time when that came out, and I think it must have been in the mid-50s, you could make a cut, and if you didn't like it, oh God, I better put a few more frames on the tail, or whatever, you could do that. You couldn't do that before that because they were using cement splices and when you cut the work print you would lose that frame that, that you made the splice on because you'd have to have enough material for the cement splice to hold. So you know, once you cut that out, you couldn't put it back. You could put a black frame in. So what happened was, and if you go backwards in editing technology evolution, you know, before people had editing machines, they would hold the film up to the to the light. And it, like one, two, two. And they could see like a hand was moving. They'd cut it there. They'd use scissors. And I guess they would paper clip the cuts together. And, and then at the end of the day, the assistant would take them and cement splice that reel. So essentially, what were you doing? You were cutting in your head. Yeah. 
Think about that. Yeah. But you, the final cut, more time, more often than not, because most of the time when the editors that I knew who did this, this was their first primary type of editing, who would just never look at the cuts, but would paper clip them together. This even in the tape, when the tape came in, a lot of these editors still wouldn't look at the cuts until the whole reel was spliced. Then they'd run it in the moviola and maybe make a few adjust, uh, adjustments, and that was it. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I. Luckily, I got to assist somebody who was cutting like that. I thought, well, Jesus Christ, I, I've got to try that. So I did it. And I, I did a whole reel without looking at the cuts. And yeah. it's amazing. Yeah. I've made a few adjustments and was done. Now, the thing is, when you're, you know, that's all well and good. But back in those days, they also weren't shooting like eight cameras with different yeah. camera speeds and all that stuff. But the point is, we had a kind of an objectivity. It was a built-in objectivity of editing because you, you couldn't look at it backwards and forwards. Once you were able to start looking at your cuts and evaluate it, my God, God, do I need to add a couple more frames? What about the, the teacup? It was in the right hand there, and now, now it's in the left hand, the cigarette. You know, the actor who jumps across the room from one take to another. I mean, all those things that you got to deal with. That's enough of that. But I'm just saying uh, objectivity has uh, changed. Yet, yet there were a lot of film editors that would come apply to work at a post house I was working at, and the post house always assume the film editor was disadvantaged, that he was overwhelmed by the choices. And I'm saying, no, I came from film editing, and do you cut the things literally? It's so much easier to punch buttons. I, mean, I, 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 I think the, the trip is that, you know, random access computer editing is a great tool set. It's obviously a much more advanced tool set than anything that preceded it, but it's a tool set. Right. You still have the same kinds of decisions to make, storytelling, performance issues, pacing, meaning. Subtext, remember subtext? I mean, it's the hidden meanings that make things better than good, but great or better. So uh, it's the same. And if anything, you can now manipulate it so much faster that when you're on a roll, I, I, I call being on a roll is like when the editing is just flowing. You can't even cut fast enough to keep up with your brain. That's not intellectual anyway, but your instinctual mm -hmm. editing flow. See what I'm saying? So, but that's, that's all internal. And it's how you relate to that machine. It's an extension of you. And that's the beauty. The extension of you now gives you much more power. I'm very glad I, I cut film because you do pre-visualize a lot more. You make a commitment. I mean, I didn't realize until I was doing tape and, and digital how little I changed things. But suddenly when it was easy to do, I went, God, I, I, I never did this. But it's not always good. I mean, there's, there's two parts of the process, which is making the commitment, but also allowing that time of free flow. You know, And you have to go back and forth. And sometimes when it's too much free flow, I think you get a little lost. So I love film editing. Yeah, I don't have as many years as you guys, but oh, um, thanks. <laughs> when I started assisting, I assisted a, an editor who who paperclip stuff, and I would splice it for him at the end of the day. It was on a movie, all. and like that was 1994, and like it was the the first and last time I ever had that ex experience. Um, and I, I was blown away because I had already been cutting on the ad. I'm like, how the hell yeah. do you? How? It's, and it, this guy had worked. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he yeah. had done years and years of television and stuff, and he just could do it. Yeah. And the cuts worked. More than like film editing, what I realized, it was kind of like slow editing, where there was a lot of thinking, a lot of thought before the decisions were made. Careful. It was very careful mindful. and mindful. It was kind of a, a slower process, and it was a very much a process of pre-visualization, which is really important, because that, pre, that ability to pre-visualize, it's like a muscle. The more you exercise that muscle, the better you're going to be at making choices and, and, and editing. That visualization muscle is really, really important, and you got to like take the time to exercise it, even though we have these really fast tools. You know. So, and I wonder if that pre-visualization helps you with when you just got a green screen and a guy, you have to fill all that stuff in yourself. If that helps you with looking for performance as opposed to. Well, you have to have a good imagination for that. Yeah. But, but pre-visualization helps if you know the material and you know the context and you know the intent of the elements that were shot. And very often we actually have real pre that we generate, but, but that's a whole other thing that's a part of editing now, which is pre-editing 
before you shoot. Think about right, that. Right, yeah, that's real. Which is cool. I mean, you know, there's an exercise that I do. Like, when I read a script, I'm actually reading it and sort of, I see it. You know, mm -hmm. I kind of cut it in my head. I'm mm -hmm. like, I kind of know. And I don't know what material I'm going to get. I have no idea how it's going to be covered, it's close ups, why, what the camera moves are going to be. But I'm making already choices in my head and of how I think it should look like, you know? Mm -hmm. And also, while I'm doing that, I can identify potential problems, you know, already in the script. While, while you're reading, think visually and, and edit in your head, you know? Mm -hmm. Could you talk a bit about the string outs, the process mm -hmm. of that? I mean, who's actually doing the string outs? I mean, are they actually editing something? So is oh, that yeah. a producer who's got a laptop and they're doing just simple or know, start and stops? Or how, what, what's the process for creating the string outs? Is that an editing position and, or an entry level position for reality? Uh, yes, it's probably an entry level position, um, part of the story department. Someone, again, who's been in the field or someone who's screened the footage um, finds um, a story they want to tell. It's fairly plain dialogue, um, not too much picture cutting, um, just cut basically for audio. Not broken into acts necessarily. I mean, for, for a half hour show, which is really 28 minutes and change, <clears throat> you might get a, a 90 minute string out, but it's pretty basic. 